Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening uh, to all the participants who are in different uh, time zones around the globe. Uh, welcome to the um, session on Education for the Culture of Peace and SDGs as a new paradigm to meet global challenges. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the sponsors for uh, developing this uh, very important summit. Uh, the UN uh, Sustainable Development Go uh, Goals call for peaceful and just societies. The uh, Interparliamentary Coalition for Global Ethics, um, we feel that um, item number 16, uh, the goal of achieving uh, peaceful societies is the main condition and the basis for the implementation of all the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Unfortunately, the means to achieve that, that goal is up to uh, each UN member on its own. And uh, they are left, uh, every nation is left up to its own devices as, a, as to how to bring this about. The Interparliamentary Coalition for Global Ethics has embarked on efforts to close this gap by promoting initiatives to achieve mandatory education on the culture of peace and the SDGs at all levels of education in all UN member states. Um, Benjamin Franklin uh, is noted uh, for saying that um, an investment in knowledge uh, pays the best interest. As we know, education requires many uh, resources like time and money, which are often hard to find. But those who do invest in these resources often end up richer, not only because they improve their financial status, but because their minds are richer too. This is, this is is especially uh, important for the implementation of um, peaceful societies, which, as we said again, is the uh, basis for all the implementation of all UN uh, member uh, states' uh, goals for the uh, sustainable development. Our participants in this session will explore the need for education on the culture of peace and the SDGs and the means to achieve the, this goal for future education and global leadership. Uh, the questions that will be considered are how can we achieve education for a culture of peace and SDGs on all education levels within a global perspective? How can we assure that future global leader, leaders are equipped with the basis, basic values of culture of peace and SDGs within the framework of higher education? Um, as again, uh, we have uh, participants from around the globe. We will start with... Um, um, Dr. Hellman is an environmental consultant, attorney, and the president of the Middle East Research Center. He was named among the United Nations Environmental Program Global 500 Roll of Honor. He is also president of the Friends of UNEP USA. Um, Dr. Hellman served as an executive director of the U.S. Committee for a Stockholm UN Conference on the Environment and uh, drafted landmark environmental laws, including those for clean air, water, waste cycling, toxic substances, ocean, oceans, mining, and noise. Uh, Dr. Hellman also received support from the United Nations to draft Israel's environmental laws and plans and was uh, instrumental in um, developing the Israeli uh, environmental um, ministry. Uh, we just hope that uh, Dr. Hellman will be with us to help draft um, the necessary legislation for education for the culture of peace. So now I give the floor to Dr. Hellman. Thank you, Shoshana. It's a real pleasure to be here with you and our other colleagues from around the globe. This is a most important, uh, really vital session. And uh, I, was, I, I tuned in early enough to hear a previous speaker say that the basis of our work was love. And she was quoting a, an author in a book that, with which I was unfamiliar. But never mind that, it really is, that clued me and cued me to the main focus of what we are doing. And this really is the basis of the, uh, of the fundamental beliefs of the world's major religions. I think of uh, Christianity where it said, what things soever you would that others do unto you, do you also unto them, for this is the law and the prophets. And then that resonates, and that is uh, also what a famous uh, rabbi said, in effect, and it's also present in Islam and other religions, as we know. So that is the basic, that is the basic principle. But this must be expanded into the details of what 
nations can do. And that's why I was pleased and privileged to be able to help create the U.S. And Environmental Protection Agency and the code of laws that still are in effect in America, as you mentioned, and also the same in Israel with their Ministry of Environmental Protection and their laws. And I've also consulted to a number of other nations and gone to uh, major international conferences like the Stockholm Conference on the Environment and the first global Con conference on the environment and then the uh, the uh, the Rio summit 20 years later. But let's bring it up to the present. Today, I believe that a vital need around the world are the basics, clean air, clean water, uh, soil that is productive and rich, uh, the flora and fauna that inhabit our planet. And so that is my goal and my objective today, and one on which I'll be happy to work with you and your colleagues. That is to help other nations, and particularly other cities, develop and, and have clean air, clean water, uh, and uh, uh, I find, I find that uh, as I look at my iPhone in the morning, all too often, I look at the, the short take of the weather in Mumbai and uh, Delhi and other major nations of the world, Mexico City, um, Beijing, and so forth. And sadly, all too often, the short take on what the weather is there is smoke. S-M-O-K-E in English, smoke. In other words, it, it is a terrible breathing, living environment for the people there. Today, we are all impressed with the danger of COVID in the COVID pandemic time. But more people, I dare say, are, are killed or have their lives shortened or their quality of life greatly restricted, particularly the old the young and those who are impaired by respiratory and other diseases. So we find that this is really a terrible plague of environmental pollution. And we must consult with and coordinate with the public officials and the corporate entities of these cities and these provinces, these states and these nations to help them deliver clean air, clean water, and a, in general, a healthy living environment for their people. Okay, just uh, we, we would like to hear from you how we can translate uh, the, uh, your efforts on uh, environmental law into legislation for education on, um, in order to achieve what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Um, we need to educate uh, the youth and uh, the public in general uh, on this issue. So thank you very much, um, Dr. Hellman. Our next speaker will be um, uh, His Excellency John Max Rakotomonji, who is a former mayor, um, minister, and speaker of the parliament of Madagascar, um, who will uh, give us a, a presentation on um, the need and the means to educate uh, the future generations uh, on the issue of the culture of peace, as, as we said, which is the foundation for environmental law and, and sustainable development, um, and uh, the SDGs. So uh, thank you, and I give the floor to His Excellency, the speaker. Thank you very much, Honorable Sotana. It's a great pleasure for me to be with you uh, today to deliver this message. Honorable Alberto Zucconi, Chairman of the Board, WAAS Secretary, Secretary General of the World University Consortium. Honorable Susana Beckerman, Founder and uh, Director, IPCGE. This dear panel participants and people who follow us online, Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is in, in a particularly difficult context that I have the honor of sharing these words with you. Our world is facing a deep crisis, and we could di not discuss about education, sustainable development goals, and culture of peace without considering our current context. 
Indeed, the COVID-19 pandemic we are all experiencing has affected our daily lives and has clearly aggravated social, economic, and gender inequalities. It has had a disproportionate impact on certain segments of the populations, particularly women, migrants, and displaced persons, margin marginalized and vulnerable groups. In addition, the pandemic has undermined trust in institutions and increased the risk of violence. In countries affected by armed conflict or where the risk of an outbreak of violence is high, the COVID-19 crisis or the response to it may have exacerbated tensions, discrimination, and perceptions of injustice regarding access to health services, decent jobs, and livelihoods. This is not just a health crisis or an economic crisis. COVID-19 has also caused the worst crisis in education and learning in a, in a century. The pandemic is disrupting the lives of children and youth. Disruption of societies and economies is having an unprecedented impact on education, compounding the crisis in education that existed before the pandemic. The pandemic has exacerbated the learning, learning crisis and its impact on the human capital of an entire, entire generation of students is likely to continue. By April 2020, 94% of the world's students or 1.6 billion children were out of school as a result of school closures. Many of them are still studying at home today in a context that marked by great uncertainty and the difficulty for families and institutions to navigate the pitfalls of continuing classes in a hybrid or distance form or even interrupting them altogether. And most countries still do not see the light at the end of the tunnel. Early data for several in high income countries already point to these learning losses and rising inequalities. Girls, education and well-being are particularly at risk as they are more likely to drop out of the school and more likely to experience violence and early marriage and pregnancy. Vulnerable groups, children with dis disabilities, ethnic minorities, refugees, and displaced persons are less likely to have access to appropriate distance learning materials and to return to school after the crisis. At the worst point in the crisis, 220 million students worldwide were affected by the closure of universities, whereas higher education is essential to a country's growth. Education impacts the knowledge, skills, values, and attitude essential to the social, economic, and political development of any country. This role is well articulated in the Sustainable Development Goal number four, which seeks to ensure equal access to quality education for all and to promote lifelong learning opportunities. In addition, target SDG 4.7 is to ensure that all students acquire the knowledge and skills necessary to promote sustainable development, including education for sustainable development and lifestyles, human rights, gender equality, promotion of cultural peace and non-violence, global citizenship, and appreciation of cultural diversity, and the contribution of culture to sustainable development. Education as the main process underpinning a culture of peace includes formal, informal, and non-formal learning, not only in school, but also in the family through the media, and in the other social institutions, not as an isolated process, but as an integral part of a global experience of learning by doing. Moreover, 
The culture of peace could play a major role in bringing back inclusivity in our pandemic response and SDGs implementation. Now, it's time to talk about actions and collaborations. Global leaders need to understand that public health and public education are closely interconnected, demonstrating the undeniable need for collaboration, solidarity, and collective action for the common good. This global pandemic will not be defeated by health measures alone. It will be solved by building civic trust, deepening human empathy, advancing science, and appreciating our common humanity. Educational authorities must work in coordination with public health authorities, and each needing the other, and each supported by the recognition of the interdependencies that occur in a public space. We cannot allow public health to be pitted against public education. Rather, our actions should be attuned to, by the, to the synergies and overlaps between the, these two dimensions around human and societal well-being. A strengthened commitment to education as a public good implies an awareness that we are educating not only children and youth, but also audiences. Moreover, community-engaged and community-led learning is a key element of education, which must be at the heart of any strategy to address current and future challenges. Education has particularly importance for refugees and in societies marked by armed conflict and civil unrest. However, in any setting, education is our most important vehicle for individual and societal development. The global pandemic has made visible the central role of adult education and lifelong learning as people of all ages must now learn to create new ways of reorganizing social, economic, and political life. Despite the major challenges posed by COVID-19, the crisis is an opportunity to transform and reimagine education systems and to begin to realize a new vision for the future of learning so that every child studies with pleasure, rigor, and determination both in and out of the classroom. This is a real opportunity to redraw the contours of the school of the future, a future that has already become a reality today. The pandemic opens up an unprecedented horizon where the long overdue investment in technology, teachers, parents, and communities can be made more quickly and optimally. Countries can learn several lessons from the pandemic, the challenge today is not to let this opportunity pass and to ensure that countries turn this major crisis into a turning point for the resolution of the learning crisis. Thanks for your attention. Well, thank you, Your Excellency, for this most insightful presentation. And um, I must say, I also just note that uh, uh, the former speaker also uh, suggested in one of our conferences at the UN uh, that each UN member state needs to appoint um, minister of peace, just as there are ministers of defense. So this is also a challenge uh, which goes hand in hand in the in need for future education on the culture of peace. And we look forward to continued collaboration. Um, Thank you very much. To our next speaker, um, um, Rabbi, Eli, Rabbi Dr. Eli Abadi is a senior rabbi of the Jewish Council of the Emirates in the United Arab Emirates. Rabbi Abadi is also the former director of the Jacob E. Safra Institute of Sephardic Studies at Yeshiva University, um, uh, with an area of interest in topics of uh, Sephardic Judaism, history, philosophy, and comparative traditional law. Dr. Abadi, uh, Dr. Rabbi, Dr. Rabbi Ali Abadi is also co-chair of the Sadat Congressional Gold Medal Committee. He's also a part-time gastroenterologist. Gastroenter uh, Rabbi Abadi has received the uh, Orden del Merito Civil, um, Civil, the highest civil decoration in Spain. So Dr. Abadi, um, uh, as as uh, the senior rabbi of the Jewish Council of the Emirates, I think you can 
uh, give us some insights into how the Abrahamic um, Accords uh, give us uh, uh, values that can be uh, extremely crucial in future education. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Shoshana. From a uh, religious point of view, I will uh, discuss, of course, uh, what uh, what uh, the Abraham Accords. But before, let me just give a, a sort of an introduction on um, on the topic of tolerance, of uh, respect, mutual respect of mutual religions. So the great Mahatma Gandhi once noted. If we are to respect others' religions as we would have them respect our own, a friendly study of the world's religions is a sacred duty, which means we need to know each other's religion. We are gathered here today in this Zoom session as political leaders, religious leaders, to find diplomatic leaders, to find a path toward a peaceful coexistence by connecting souls of all core religionists and all people especially the world's three Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. As Edmund Burke said, religion is essentially the art and theory of remaking of man. And therefore, we as religious leaders ought to embark in remaking mankind to cherish, protect, and foment tolerance and peaceful coexistence. As the United Nations Manifesto and the Culture of Peace stated very clearly, Quote, we must learn to use one another's religious belief as ways to connect, not as reason for conflict. For 800 years, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam were inextricably intertwined in medieval Spain. Each had a common ancestry, similar values, and holy scriptures. As Genesis 42 verse 13 states, we are all brothers, children of one father. Now, living together side by side in Spain, very often in close quarters, the people of these religions flourished. They naturally found a way of understanding and respecting each other's culture, bringing forth an enlightened culture. However, gradually over the next several centuries, larger forces vying for power gave way to puritanical judgments, absolutisms, and religious extremism. Ultimately, these exclusive policies and the conflict they unleashed extinguished the shared learning that had flourished. The fragile unity between these three faiths were lost. As religious leaders or as political leaders or diplomatic leaders, as any leaders of any human group, we are enjoined by our faiths to find a path towards a peaceful coexistence between all religions and all people. Therefore, in order to establish a channel of communication and cooperation on an international level, we must continually ask of ourselves what we insist from our own people, and that is the acceptance of diversity. First, as leaders, we must lead by example and communicate to our own congregations and people, nations, groups, that peace is a basic human right. Jewish scriptures in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, teach us to love thy neighbor as thyself. It is a directive that teaches each one of us here today to love one another through peace, acceptance, and understanding. Second, as each of us takes enormous pride in our own religion and religion's history, culture, and strength, so too we must pride ourselves on the level of understanding and tolerance, right, for other religions and cultures. As we encourage our people, our groups, to have pride in their own religion, we must castigate, however, our people should intolerance and ignorance of other religions and culture arises. Third, it is our responsibility to guide our congregations and our people towards looking for the inestimable value of peace and not in the supposed importance of religious conflict. Yes, the world is made up of different races, colors, ethnicities, religions, political ideology. However, the seeds of peace begin to grow when people of all faiths and backgrounds are encouraged to communicate, tolerate, accept, and ultimately trusts, trust one another. Today, 
ordinary people from all three faiths share a deep desire for peace and justice. I see it every day here in this country that I'm living. They all aspire to seek to encourage a model friendship and respect for each other. If you have seen many of the articles that are coming out of the United Arab Emirates with the co collaboration and embrace of each other, of Jews, Muslims, and Christians all together. Just one article just came out actually today in the Times of Israel of how we celebrated Hanukkah all together. Now we as religious leaders of our respective faiths or political leaders of our respective city, country, do also share a deep desire for peace and justice. I am sure about that. We will work towards it and we pledge our time, efforts and wherewithal to the implementation of the culture of peace between people, of peaceful coexistence between nations and religions. So our aim should be threefold. One, to stand together should any of our communities suffer harassment or attack. Two, to respond together to events, local or global, which have an impact on the relationships between the Jewish, Christian, and Muslim people. Unfortunately, we have seen it. When an event is happening in a faraway country between two religions or two nations, immediately the entire world rises mm -hmm. to fight amongst each other. They could be thousands of miles away. Instead of working towards trying to resolve that conflict that might be 3,000 miles away, what happened is that the youth and the people start fighting each other even as far as 10,000 miles away because there is a conflict so far away and somewhere else. We need to get together and try to resolve that. Three, to overcome some of the misrepresentations, demonization, stereotyping, prejudice, and lack of awareness in the world through an ongoing educational process that teaches peace and respect for each religion with a goal of a peaceful and respectful coexistence. Education, education, education. It is the only, if not the only way, most important way to change the course and the future of this world of wars, hatred, demonization. If we continue to support textbooks for children, six years old, seven years old, 10 years old, 12 years old, textbooks that are full of hatred towards another nation or towards another religion or towards another ethnicity, we are giving hand to evil. We cannot allow textbooks. And many of those, unfortunately, I'm going to be blunt and straightforward, are supported by the United Nation itself. Textbooks that demonize other people, demonize other nations, demonize other races, demonize other religions. And those children grow up to be hateful of those people. These textbooks incite violence. If we want to change the world, we ought to eradicate those textbooks and change them with textbooks that show love, harmony, coexistence, tolerance, and embrace of each other's religion, culture, and tradition. That is the way, because otherwise we cannot change that generation for another 25 years and we would have missed that great opportunity. It is time to take the initiative without waiting for more ignorance, hatred, and war to occur. It's time to actively bring peace where there is conflict. It is time to seek the good out of evil, hope out of despair, and love out of hatred. It is time to allow our love of God and respect for his covenant to protect and multiply the children of Abraham, to materialize into a worldwide covenant of peace and protection for all of humanity. It is only through that that we can connect souls and connect people. Given the many examples in history, as well as some conflicts which are so recent, that they continue to take place as we speak here in the region in which I'm living, few countries away. They demonstrate the need for religious leaders to speak out and preach against religious intolerance and superiority. And also it's incumbent upon political leaders and diplomatic leaders and educational leaders and social leaders to speak against intolerance and superiority. The core of these conflicts stem from the idea that one's religion is the superior one giving a person or group of people the religious duty to impose their religion on others or suffer the penalty of death. And we have seen it and we continue to see it, as I said, not too far from here. Terminology such as infidels and heretics 
ought to be eliminated from our vocabulary. Using these words allow the zealots to attack, persecute, force conversions, and even kill anyone who has been branded as such. And we have seen it. As, as leaders, we ought to condemn the use of this terminology. Equally as important, we need to preach that religion and religious values can and should be transmitted through love, acceptance, and tolerance. Religion can only be appreciated if transmitted peacefully and with the consent and wholehearted acceptance of the individual. We as leaders have the responsibility to highlight the beauty of religion while teaching our own people how religion can bring harmony, peace, and understanding. On five occasions, the Bible, one in Leviticus, three in Ezekiel, and one in Nehemiah, each state that the religious statutes given by the Almighty are so man, and I quote, so mankind can live through them. And our sages in the Talmud expound on this announcement by saying specifically, that by obeying the religious statutes, we are to live through them and not to die through them. And not to claim that the person is dying in the name of God and killing other people at the same time. In Psalms 34, chapter 34, verse 15, King David exhort us to search for peace and pursue it. Our sages and ethics of the father state, be from the disciples of Aaron, the high priest, love peace, pursue peace, and love your fellow human being. Each one of us here today can say that as leaders, we are encouraging our people to pursue peace and love one another. All of us can affect change by planting the seeds of true peace amongst ourselves and our co-religionists. We can come to a reconciliation of the people. Three times daily, we pray the following. He who makes peace in his high heavens, may he in his mercy bring peace upon us and upon the entire world. And let us say amen. Peace be unto you and assalamu alaikum, shalom alaikum. And here, living in the United Arab Emirates, specifically Dubai, after the Abraham Accord, I see on a daily basis the beautiful coexistence, peaceful, harmonious living amongst, amongst all the people and all religions. The, 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 the nationalities that live in the United Arab Emirates are over 202 nations. We all live in peace and respect and every single world religion has a temple here and has people that worship here, all living in peaceful coexistence, respect and harmony. Now, do we agree with each other's religion? No, we may not, right? Otherwise there would be only one religion. We all cherish our own religion. We all cherish our own tradition. But that doesn't mean that we ought not to cherish the other religion for other people. And we ought to respect that. And this, uh, this Abraham Accord have become a model that have spread, as you know very well, to Bahrain, to Morocco, to the Sudan, and to Serbia and Croatia already. And so many many of the countries are seeing the benefit of the Abraham Accords, the unity, the togetherness, the embrace, and yes, the business, and yes, the well-being of the nations and of the people of all these countries as they cooperate together. It is for that that the Quran says that God made nations and people so they get to get to know each other and not fight each other. And the only way we can get to know each other, and with that I conclude, is by accepting each other, by respecting each other, by cherishing each other's different traditions and respecting them, while at the same time being proud of our religion and tradition. Let us hope that God will bless us with this enlightenment as we just celebrated the holiday of Hanukkah, the holiday of light, where we bring light to the world, that God should enlighten our paths to live in peace, harmony, and coexistence. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, Rabbi Dr. Abadi, for this most eloquent uh, presentation. Um, you really hit on the core issue, and uh, we definitely look forward to continue to work together um, to put all of these uh, values into the model content of uh, the educational curriculum that we need for the culture of peace and the SDGs. I think you will find a good partner in Dr. Wafik Mustafa, our next uh, speaker. 
Uh, Dr. Mustafa um, is a London-based doctor and a British politician and political commentator on several uh, Middle East and international TV channels. He's often called on to comment on um, uh, issues in the news and BBC. He is the author of Egypt, The Elusive Arab Spring, Egypt, A Nation in Crisis, published in London, as well as the founder and chairman of the British Arab Network and is often seen at events with the Prime Minister of the UK and other um, uh, major officials. So now I give the floor to Dr. Mustafa. It's so much a pleasure to see you, Shujana, and your effort to us to meet for this gathering, uh, which we always have worked for many, many years. I've known you. Um, culture of peace, of course, is very important aspect of human life uh, because the world cannot get on together without cultural peace. The only going to turbulence, wars, civil wars, dictatorship, people in prison unneededly, uh, killings, uh, people will die unneededly as it happened in COVID-19. I think it's, uh, it's very important to develop culture of peace through so all levels of governance and drive it in the best possible way uh, in a local level or international level. Local level is important to see stability in countries like Middle East particularly, uh, because Africa is reasonably stable now. Uh, East Europe is reasonably stable apart from a few reaches, but Middle East is still in trouble. Um, but stability produce peace, like uh, Abraham Accord, for example, uh, because the Gulf countries are reasonably stable and rich and doesn't have a lot of problems uh, and was able to hold peace, warm peace with Israel. Egypt had peace for 40 odd years, but still, unfortunately, I think it's still called peace and uh, still having some struggle to create really a proper relationship, despite being neighbors in uh, borders, uh, there's not a relationship I would like to see, uh, because the distance between Alexandria and Tel Aviv is not that long. There used to be trains between uh, these uh, cities, connecting these cities early part of the last century. So in the 21st century spin, it's quite possible to do again and to do it in a better way. I, I want to say that to, you know, to add a little bit more, uh, because I could see my colleagues have covered many corners of the um, culture of peace, uh, is to say that peace requires stability, requires democracy, requires rule of law, requires institutions, and because if you have a democracy, you have a better education, have better education, have better tolerance, and uh, you have better understanding of the world and the needs for good health, good education, and good welfare system, good communication between people, and good travel between countries. So I think education is very important to stem and. As my own background, as you know, from Egypt and Middle East, I think history needs to be rewritten properly and revised because history books and curriculum still geared, as my colleague said, the word infidels, for example. It needs to be banned. It needs to be laws against it. It needs to be criminalized to use this word uh, because the word infidels is a form of severe discrimination and it should be banned officially by United Nations. And this can only happen by pressure and persuasion from the great power like the United States, Europe, uh, and some extent the United Nations. I, I want to say that um, important uh, to see expansion of uh, peace and connectivity between particularly the Arab region or Middle East region, because we could see now a few countries in the Middle East, probably Saudi Arabia, 
and probably Sudan. Um, Egypt needs to improve its stance a bit more than just piece on paper. Uh, I think North Africa, like Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia should join, uh, and Iraq, uh, and the Lebanon, probably Syria, and stabilize. So I think, I think it's important. The hate culture needs to end. The hate culture comes from dictatorship, comes from instability, comes from internal turbulence. It becomes as a substitute to a rule of law. So I think it's important to have a culture of peace and uh, internal stability, internal peace between people. Because when you get a country who is divided, civil war, how can you have peace with other people if you can't have peace with yourself? So I think it's very important to look at it uh, that way. I, uh, I really can't add any more except to say to thank you, Shushan, and thank everybody. Uh, and I enjoyed the talk. And uh, I really, I think one thing as well, uh, might be a bit issue, but being a Muslim myself, I can talk about, we need Islamic reformation. I say it clearly. That's very important because we talked about infidels, it's a religious term. It, we need some form of reformation to, to be able to be in world footing of understanding peace and harmonization with the rest of the world. And you need, you need leader elected, not people just come from the top by parachute or by, by military coup, so there it is. So I think, I think we, we've got a way to go, but we must pursue and must uh, persuade the United States, particularly, and Europe to lead the way. And thank you very, very much. Well, I thank you for all of these uh, most important uh, insights. Um, I think we have here very influential people who can um, help uh, push this uh, agenda forward. Um, we are now in the process uh, of um, uh, establishing parliamentary caucuses for the culture of peace, uh, promoting, promoting the, the education for the culture of peace and SDGs. Uh, the, the first caucus uh, has been confirmed in the Israeli Knesset. Uh, we are working to uh, reestablish the caucus in uh, the Congress. Um, and uh, hopefully we will have enough, uh, well, again, since the Council of Europe is made up of 48 uh, nations, <laughs> Uh, we hope that um, uh, Speaker Raka Tamamonji will help us with the uh, African uh, Union and the African Parliament to get this in, in the all, all the uh, African nations. And of course, in the Middle East, we have the Abrahamic Accords, and hopefully this will be expanded. Um, you spoke um, again about uh, the hate culture. This is one of the core issues that needs to be uh, um, in instilled in uh, the educational system to do away with the hate culture, as uh, you all uh, mentioned. Um, again, uh, without education for the culture of peace, the SDGs will not, uh, will not succeed. Um, you can't have uh, environmental protection when there, is, uh, when there are hostilities. Uh, we even see the hate culture in countries uh, which are peaceful countries like the United uh, States, where the country is divided and, and pitched against each other. So that um, this, uh, this task becomes more and more uh, crucial um, with each new day. Um, I know that uh, an, another one of our speakers from UNESCO uh, was supposed to um, uh, participate, but has no uh, is traveling and has no Zoom access. UNESCO also uh, has um, uh, a new uh, initiative called Reimagining Our Futures Together, um, a new social contract for education. Um, the report that they are working on um, will be uh, available, I think, in the beginning of 2022. Um, I will just read a, a short um, uh, sort of summary of what they are aiming for. Um, UNESCO notes our humanity and planet Earth are under threat. Urgent action taken together is needed to change course and reimagine our futures. 
Education, long acknowledged as a powerful force for positive change, has new, urgent, and important work to do. Informed by a global consultation process engaging about 1 million people, this report of the International Commission on the Futures of Education invites governments, institutions, organizations, and citizens around the world to forge a new social contract for education that would help us build peaceful, just, and sustainable futures together and for all. Um, I sincerely hope that we will be able to continue to work together and also have an impact on uh, this UNESCO um, uh, report together with the World Academy of Arts and, and Sciences Administration and their project on uh, futures education. And um, hopefully, um, we, we, the, at least for the future generations, we have some hope. Um, the, again, the, the Abrahamic Accords are uh, an example of what can be done. Um, and uh, hopefully we will be able to work together to continue uh, our most important um, effort and initiative. I think the one thing we could really press on that the culture of hate uh, in its end, we are in 2021, we can't just go on like uh, 60, 70 years ago, where nobody knows anything and you only listen to local, whatever the dictator tell you uh, stories. But now everything is open. So the word infidel and hate need to be criminalized in some way, particularly, I think if you criminalize the word infidel, you can, uh, that's a big, big step forward, actually, because it is a form of discrimination. So I think that's very important in my view, except to whatever my colleagues will think. Well, hopefully if we, if we uh, are successful to have a caucus on uh, education for the culture of peace in the UK, uh, parliament, which maybe you can help us with, um, we can move forward on, on that issue as well. Yes. Um, is there a, 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 any way that in, uh, we can instill this into uh, an initiative also for the uh, Abrahamic Accords? Perhaps we can, because it is, it is a discrimination uh, in a localized area of of about 22 states. They probably don't think of it because it's been going on for about a thousand years, so people get used to the term. But if we think about it, it is very, very, uh, very discriminating word, uh, demeaning word. So I think as well, it will help to secularize the nations as well. Because if you remove this word out, you're not saying being secular is a bad word uh, or bad phrase because the religion the Middle East love to play with words like that, which is, they say is divine. There's no divinity about the word uh, uh, being infidel. There's no divinity at all about it. It's either your religion or not religion, but the infidel is extremely demeaning uh, word. Well, we know also that social media plays a big role in um, advancing hostilities. Uh, yeah, it can, it can change. It can change. And if, uh, for example, the word uh, infidel were to be uh, banned on social media, maybe that's a first step. I mean, part of um, the future education is technology. And, good idea. Uh, good idea. Social media, Facebook. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe that's something uh, in addition to uh, the content of uh, culture of uh, peace uh, uh, curriculum, uh, we can work towards the uh, technology giants uh, banning this word and um, any, uh, you know, any kind of uh, terminology that leads to hostilities uh, or to crime or to violence. That's part of the culture of peace uh, today. Uh, maybe we should uh, just conclude with um, another quote by Shai Reshef, uh, who is the educational entrepreneur, founder and president of the University of People. Um, he says that when you educate one person, when you educate one person, you can change a life. When you educate many, you can change the world. 
Um, the University of the People is uh, the world's first nonprofit tuition free accredited university. Um, he made it his life mission to help open the gates to higher education. Uh, the university um, was, uh, I mean, the headquarters, I think, is in California. Um, he received a grant also from the um, uh, Bill Gates uh, Foundation. I think there, as far as I've seen, there are over 100,000 um, students uh, registered uh, at this University of the People from all over the globe. Maybe this is uh, one way to start uh, education for the culture of peace and open it up um, really as, as a, a curriculum for the people, uh, um, global education, both on media and in universities. Um, and of course, with the value starting from kindergarten up, um, which again is the basis for peaceful societies uh, without which we cannot have sustainable development or any sort of um, prospect for the future. So um, I thank you all. Uh, if there's any other comment or um, we, hopefully we will follow up with all of you uh, in the future and we'll, with the World Academy of Arts and Sciences uh, to implement this in reality, not only in words. Um, as you know, there are many UN resolutions on the culture of peace and of course, there are the sustainable development goals, which um, are being um, uh, tested and uh, evaluated uh, on an um, annual basis. Um, on the culture of peace, again, most of uh, the uh, action has been on paper. So we need to really get to the UN, uh, to all the UN member parliaments and uh, have legislation drawn up, which will mandate uh, education for the culture of peace and ban um, any sort of terminology which uh, really um, cultivates uh, the, the um, hate mongering and uh, violence uh, throughout the world um, in, all of, uh, in all of the different societies. Dr. Mustafa, you wanted to say something? Okay. Another word, which is uh, probably you, a lot of people don't say it, the word Zionist in Arabic, Sayuni. It means, it says, well, it doesn't mean negative term rather than positive term as what you can see it. I know it's used very often, say, so Zionist means, I told them it's nationalism, like Arab nationalism, Zionism. But still, people don't understand what it means in Arab world because it's never been explained properly. And that is a, a big issue. Because Nasser rules have said it every day, every night for 30 odd years. And people misunderstand it, especially synonymous to uh, infidel uh, in a different way. So I think the good thing about Abraham Accord, Abraham Accord starting in a clean sheet. So it can actually spring it better than, say, from Cairo or from. Uh, or from Jordan, but I think it certainly can come from the Gulf countries much better because they started in a positive term and warm up to the idea of good peace with Israel. Good peace with the Jews is very important. Well, that would be a model for all areas of conflict. Um, I'll just uh, conclude with um, the uh, UNESCO uh, goal here for their reimagining our futures together. Um, this initiative argues, above all, that it is through millions of individual and collective acts of courage, leadership, resistance, creativity, and, and care that we will change course and transform education to build just, equitable, peaceful, and sustainable futures. So that is the goal for all of us, and I hope we will continue to work together to achieve this goal uh, with the help of the Almighty. 